recording pet sounds. And then they came in and he said, okay, here are your parts, sing these songs. And uh, it was a huge departure for them. And there was a lot of uh, controversy within the group and within the family about the, the, the turn that Brian, the creative turn that Brian had made. Brian doesn't have a mean bone in his body. He's a sweetheart. He's a wonderful guy. He was always trying to, uh, to, to make everybody happy in the band. He was getting so much flack from certain people in the group about doing it that he, that he went overboard to make it like a group album. But it was, it was all him. It was, it was a, basically a solo album. And I, I would think if you asked uh, the guys in the group, reluctantly, they might say, yeah. And I think there was also some fear that, you know, he was getting farther and farther away from the band. And as a result, he was going to leave the band and do his own thing, at which point everyone's sweet living, this whole family industry was going to fall apart because Brian was going to say, you know, screw you guys, I'm going to do my own industry. So the fact that he ended up releasing Caroline No as a solo single was like a shot across the bow and kind of made him freak out a little bit, more than a little bit. Given the distance that he's traveled from the traditional uh, settings and narratives of Beach Boy songs, that I think probably they began to put two and two together and think that uh, this was not moving in a the direction they wanted to go. Indeed, on returning from tour to be presented with the Pet Sounds instrumentals, some in the band expressed reticence over the sound of the material, with Mike Love cautioning Brian not to carry the Beach Boys too far from the tried and tested. Yeah, don't fuck with the formula was really, he said that straight up. Tony Asher attests to that, um, having heard it. Uh, and, but there was, but Mike was by no means the only one who didn't want, you know, who felt, you know, like the record was not the record that they needed to make at that time. The brothers were bitching and moaning too. They didn't like how complex the arrangements were. They didn't like the fact that Brian was, was listening to them so closely and would brook no bum notes at all. I don't really think that that's true about the band. I, I think the band, uh, they trusted Brian and he made great tracks. I think we were more of one mind than you would think. I mean, we all have pretty good ears, you know, and, and we were smart enough to know there's a song on top of those tracks to come, you know, and it always does work out with Brian in those days. I was there when Brian mastered it. He puts on the first tape, wouldn't it be nice? And it starts playing the first side and it's going through. And I'm thinking how, how great it sounds. And Brian looks over at me and says, well, Fred, what do you think? And I said, Brian, man, whew, great, great record. It's really good. I'm, I like it. I really like it. He said, do you really like it? I said, yeah, I really like it. And then he, then he asked me the, the tell-all question. He said, what do you think the guys will think? Meaning, what do you think the other Beach Boys will think? And I said, you know, I don't know, Bri, but I'm proud of you. It's a great record. I don't know what they think, but I think it's a great record. I think you did a great job. And he says, man, I sure hope they like it. Well, as we know, a couple of them didn't. Capital didn't. With Capital Records showing little enthusiasm for the sonic invention of Pet Sounds, the record became the lowest selling Beach Boys release in years. While Brian became discouraged by the muted response to his grand artistic statement, the label delivered the ultimate slap in the face. Just weeks after the release of Pet Sounds, they issued the Best of the Beach Boys compilation, Surf Music and All. Capital was a little confused by Pet Sounds, uh, you know, and, and they were kind of thinking, okay, wow, Brian, nice work. Uh, get volume one, best of the Beach Boys ready, everybody, marketing staff. Yeah, we'll look for some singles. You know, they were just getting ready to write the band off, I think. You know, he was working within the context of the, the music industry, and the music industry that was just beginning to feel uh, its possibilities for major sums of money. And so they were not interested in the, the Beach Boys, of all people, breaking new ground. I mean, they saw the Beach Boys as hit makers, like go make hits. 
you know, a song called, you know, Hang On To Your Ego, that's not going to wash. And, and in many ways, you know, Mike Love probably agreed with the critique. These, you know, complicated, strange, uh, very beautiful, but not necessarily uh, contained songs. I mean, they didn't really provide Mike Love with much of a platform. And, you know, there you have the origins of difficulties that went on for decades after that. You know, that was the moment. You know, I mean, Pet Sounds was the moment. It's sad, though, in a lot of ways. I mean, it, it's something that drove Brian deeper into isolation. It was something that, in a more nurturing atmosphere, he might have had a happier time and even a more productive time. They didn't believe in it, you know? And then here, you know, the records end up selling off of it. The 45s off Pet Sounds did well. So Brian Wilson must have been very frustrated by that. I'm, I'm certain of it. But because Wouldn't It Be Nice and Guy Lionel's had such a good successful run in the summer of 1966, and then Brian Wilson works that summer on Good Vibrations, and that becomes number one in America and in England. Capitol just does a complete about face, and they throw money into the next Beach Boys album, which would have been Smile. The project that would eventually become known as Smile started life during the lengthy gestation of Good Vibrations that ran throughout 1966. Initial recordings for Good Vibrations had taken place as part of the Pet Sound sessions, but the song had taken on a life and logic of its own, with Brian moving between studios to rework the material. While Pet Sounds had come and gone, he was still tortuously fashioning a final version of the track and running up a ballooning studio bill in the process. I got my info from Carl, and he would just give us little progress reports, you know, and Brian would just, like a great filmmaker, you know, shoot a scene several different ways, edit it several different ways, and, and I'm just going to guess Brian wasn't ready. He probably wasn't thinking, well, we need this to drive the marketing of Pet Sounds. I don't think he was thinking of it that way. I think he was totally in pure, wonderful, once-in-a-lifetime artist mode, and and it just didn't make the cut. We did many, many sessions, not as many nearly as some of the other people have stated. But it was true that we, you know, he'd call me and he'd say, can you get the crew in? We're going to work at five o'clock or something like that. Say, you know, and nobody wanted to miss that. So whatever we were doing, we were there at five o'clock. And we would sit down and Brian would play something at the piano. And then he'd say, forget it, I'm out of here. And he'd leave. So we worked for 15 minutes, if that. We wondered at the time, we said, gee, he's sure is spending a lot of time, but we knew it was a hit. Uh, he, he was trying to achieve something righteous and something artistic with something pretty simple. It, it was simple. The simpler tunes are the, are the toughest ones to, to make into a hit record. Pet Sounds, yes, great, wonderful. If we had uh, included the version you heard, we all heard, uh, in mono, I have to add mono, of uh, Good Vibrations, be a different Beach Boys story. 